what I'm going to present today is I'm going to take you on a, on a tour of iconography, but I'm also going to do it very much in the context of this conference. So it's important to understand that because I'm going to, to point to certain things about the images that I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to try to help you, hopefully, see the structure of these images and help you see how the structure of these images are related to the question of, of consciousness, the question of attention, the problem of the imaginal, especially uh, that John has been bringing up in his discussion, and how the language, the visual language of the church, the spatial language of the church, how it is a, a a kind of imaginal vision or imaginal participation in the, the structure of reality. So sorry, I use these words, but it's important to understand that what I'm about to say is in no way trying to take away from the theological aspect, the, 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 uh, the, the fact that these images are meant to help people worship, to participate, you know, to have a, a reminders of holy images of holy things and so it's very important because this is that aspect is very very important to me but because our conference is about consciousness i think it's 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 uh, it's important to try to connect it together and to also help you see how it is that religious language and religious imagery can help us uh, peer into the the problem or the question of our experience in the world and how we deal with that and so the image you're looking at right now is an image called the deusis. And the deusis is the basis of Christian art. That is, it, it is, you'll see, I'm going to take you through the steps in terms of the history of the images. I'm going to show you old images, how the image develops, but also how it really does become the central image of the, the Christian church up to the Renaissance. And so a lot of things happened in the Renaissance which transformed the language of religious art, made it far more, um, say, sentimental, more uh, dramatic. A lot of things were brought into the art to showcase the talent of the artist. To, to, uh, and so one of the things that happened is that the ancient language of the church that was developed organically and, and universally for 1,200, 1,300 years, slowly started to slip away from people's memory. And so uh, an image, for example, that everybody knows, which is, you know, the Michelangelo's creation of God, of, of Michelangelo's God's creation of, of, uh, of Adam, you know, with the two fingers showing, is an absolute anomaly in the history of Christian art. It's a complete freak thing that shows up. And although we tend to think of it as some kind of model of an image, a religious image of showing God creating Adam, it's actually a complete aberration, which, which actually never even gave fruit in the church. So there are no other versions of that image. Whereas a traditional language is more like a poetic form. As it installs itself, it creates these patterns. And then these patterns, like a folk dance, for example, is a good way to understand it. There are patterns of movement that get taken up by people and that we can recognize in different folk dances, although there's some difference, there's a common language of coming together, of ways to move, and that is the manner in which we have to understand traditional languages of art. They are participative. They're there to bring you into the community, bring you into a common experience, and in the, in the case of the, the Christian art, this is something which happened very surprisingly in an organic manner. So if you had gone into a church in England or a church in Syria in the year 1000 or 1100, you would have found your way. There would have been difference. There would have been some cultural difference, but you would be able to recognize the characters and the figures and you'd be able to find your way through the imagery that was presented. And we don't have texts. There are no texts that tell us this is how the images have to be. It is something which happened in a very organic manner and through ways in mechanical causes that are very mysterious to us, like 
where there are bands of artists traveling the world, exchanging with each other. We don't even know how it, it happened, but it happened. Um, and so the image of the deusis is an image that you still will find today in an Orthodox church, often on the iconostasis. It is the central image of the church, and what it represents is Christ stand in the center, often on a throne, for sure in a kind of royal uh, stance. Christ is actually dressed as a Roman senator, as a Roman nobleman, and he is holding in his left hand a book, and with his right hand, he is gesturing. He's blessing, but just, just think that he's gesturing with his, with his right hand. And so he is the center. And then from the center, then we have series of saints. And those that are close to Christ are always the same. So we have on the right hand of Christ, Mary, the mother of God, when, I say that, when I'm going to say right and left, by the way, it's always going to be from the point of view of the image, okay? Because the point of view of Christ. So on Christ's right, you will have the mother of God, Mary, and then on his left, you will have St. John the Baptist, St. John the Foreigner, or, or and, on his right, you will have St. Peter, on his left, you will have St. Paul, and then after that, it can be more, there's more flexibility in terms of the types of saints that will, that will be represented next to him. And often also there will be uh, angels, but we'll get to the angels later. So the image of the deesis is an eschatological image. It is an image of the end of time. It is an image of the totality of all things. That's better to think about it that way. So we think about the end of times. We have funny scenarios that play in our mind. The best way to understand the end of time is to understand it as it's this, the place or the time in which all things are now revealed. Everything that is to be revealed has been revealed. So it's all things, the totality of all things. So Christ on his throne is also a judge. And those that are next to him, they are emanating from him. They are also interceding towards him in this totality of all things. And so this image, we're going to get to the meaning slowly. So just try to remember as much as you can, but don't worry, I, I will... I will uh, come back to it. So this image is one of the oldest images that we have. You can change the, the slide. So as soon as churches started to be built after the persecution, this image appears right away. So these are sent, these in the churches, the oldest churches we have where these decorations are still up are in Rome. And so we find in the fourth century this eschatological image. So here again, we have Christ sitting on a throne. Like I told you, his right hand, he's gesturing. In his left hand, he's holding a script, a book, a scroll. So it can have different shapes. And then on his, so now it flips though. We'll see why it flips. On one side of him, you have St. Paul, he's here. On the other side, you have St. Peter. He's there, and they are receiving crowns. And those, the, that which is crowning the two, one is known or understood to be the church of the Jews, and the other is understood to be the church of the Gentiles. And above them, you see these strange animals with wings. So the reason why you have these strange animals with wings is that this is, it's, it's a revelation. It's not, and that's why when you think about the end of times, I, I, I'm trying to, to help you see that it's the revelation of all things. So those beasts that you see with the wings, the, those are the beasts that we find in the vision of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel has this vision of God, or he actually has a vision of the throne of God, 
and he sees these four beasts, a lion, an eagle, a man, and a bull. And that vision, so all of this gets brought together in this space. So now we again see the chariot or the throne of God, but now Christ is sitting in the chariot or throne of God that Ezekiel saw in the book of Ezekiel. And surrounding him are these four aspects. Now the four beasts in Ezekiel, they are four aspects of the divine revelation, but they ultimately also come to represent the four gospels. So we understand, again, Christ in the center, and now pointing to him, emanating from him, you can see it from both ways, that is, him being the source of these saints and of these images, or him also being the culmination of these images in the center. Okay, so you can see it going out or coming in. Uh, and so the, the four Gospels is a, one aspect of that. So we understand that Christ is beyond the Bible. I hope everybody still believes that. Christ is beyond scripture, Christ is a person, Christ is a revelation, and that revelation is not fully contained, but appropriately contained into four corners, right? so four aspects, which come to be the four gospels. Okay? So you have one in the middle, and then you have four, Outside, That's, It's really important because when we're going to get later, you're going to start to see why that matters. It's a chariot. It's, like it's, a, it's, a, it's a stable body for the invisible one, which is behind the four. So you can understand it. We'll get to it later, but you can understand it as the ancient way that people understood the world. So you have the dome of heaven, and then you have the square of the earth, okay? And it's just for the same reason a table works, right? For something to have a stable manifestation, you need four, two sets of opposites for it to hold together. Uh, and that's why it's also a chariot. So a chariot is more mobile, but it still has the four wheels that stabilize the invisible one which is behind it. All right, so this, so the original decorations of churches right at the outset, at the, in the fourth century, were based on the book of Revelation. They were based on the apocalypse. Why? Because the worshipers are participating in the kingdom when they come to the church. They are participating in the, the all things. They, they are, they're, they are participating actively in the final revelation. So we still have interesting little memories of that even now in, in for example, the Orthodox liturgy, which when we come to the final moment after the consecration, we thank God for all he has done and we thank God, uh, we thank God for, for, the, for the coming, for the death, for the resurrection, for the ascension on the, the right hand of God and the final coming as if it's already happened because this is eschatological time, you could say, the totality of all things is hidden in now. Right? It's not just something that happens at the end. Right? You could say that it's the final, the final love or the final vision that's pulling all reality towards it. Now, what does this have to do with, with consciousness? The way to understand this is to understand the relationship between the center and that which is around it. So Christ is the focus point, right? And then from that focus, you will have a, a current moving in and a current moving out. You'll have an aspect which is moving towards Christ and an aspect which is moving away from Christ. This is the way to understand 
that the fir even the very first icon. So this is an image of the Last Judgment. Um, it's an image also of the eschaton. So we have Christ in the center, right? And you, those who are Christian, will know the text. And we, it was read yesterday. It was, it was actually read uh, this morning, or was it? We, we, we read, read yesterday, sorry. Well, yeah, when Scott presented the, the, the Abbey. And so on his right hand, he has the sheep. And on his left hand, he has the goats. To those on the right, he says, come. To those on the left, he says, move away. OK? This is one of mine. I put a few of my icons because I thought some people wanted to see them. Um, here again, this is the same image. We have Christ. He is represented as the final revelation of all things. And on the one side, he's got the blessing hand. And on the other side, he holds the book. With one hand, he says to the sheep, come. With the other hand, he says to the goats, move away. And so we have to really understand that as, a, as an image of of, of reality itself. That is, you can understand it as, a, as, as attention even. So attention itself has those two aspects to them. That is, there's something, there are aspects that are drain, that are, say, concentration, and there are aspects which are dissipation. And we can understand it as a pattern of attention, but we can understand it as a pattern of everything that exists. So a, a, any group has an aspect of it which is moving towards its identity and an aspect of it which is moving away from its identity. In this image, it's presented as negative. That is, he says to the sheep, come, and he says to the goat, move away. He's sending the goats to the fire, and he's bringing the sheep into the kingdom, right? into the, the, the place which is contained. But it's not necessarily negative. So go back, go back, uh, no, actually, go back up to the first one. Right. So it's not necessarily negative. It can only be, it can be seen just as a moving out and a moving in. So once you look at the characteristics of those that are presented on the left side and the right hand of Christ, you're going to start to notice that this is what's going on, let's say. And so the mother of God is represented. So the, the mother of God and St. John the Foreigner, they are the two that preceded Christ, the two that pointed to him. And in the way they're represented, they, repre they, they manifest two opposites. They're seen as opposites from each other. So the mother of God, just look at them. You can see it, in, especially in them, you can see that. The mother of God is covered. She is clothed, right? She is hidden, and she is seen as the one who, for those who are traditional Christians, right, the one who brings mercy, right? She's the one who also, uh, if you look at her, at her uh, more traditional stories, she was hidden inside the, the, the Holy of Holies. You know, she has the secret aspect to her. Um, and it says in scripture that when she saw the things that were happening after she gave birth to Christ, it says she gathered all the things in her heart. Okay? That's really important. Actually, the word gather is, is symbolo. It's related to the notion of the way that I talk about symbolism. She gathered all these multiple events into her heart. Okay? So that is the image of her on the right side of Christ, which is the side that we saw before as the side of mercy side that gathers the sheep into the kingdom. Now on the left side of Christ, we have the wild man who lives in the desert, who screams to tell people to, to repent, who takes people down into death, into the water. And so all these aspects of the opposite of what she is, is represented at these two currents, we could say, that are on the right hand and the left hand of Christ. So now, the left hand, which is this move away, this pushing away from the center, is not necessarily bad in itself, right? But you can see that that's what it is, right? You can see the difference between, uh, if, 
you, find, if you know the story, the legend of how the mother of God uh, passes, dies, she, she reposes and then all the disciples magically are gathered to her in like through the air. It's like this crazy story. So they're all gathered to her and they are gathered around her as this, as this, as this hole, as this thing that is surrounding the home of, of Christ. Right? And so how is St. John killed? He's split in two. He's cut in half, right? Separated. Right? Of course, in, in this case, like I said, it's, it's really to help you see the difference between this gathering in, this pushing away, this gathering together, and this spreading apart, this breaking apart, okay? Now, if we look at the other ones that uh, are next to him, we'll find St. Peter and St. Paul. And again, you'll have the same structure repeated through different images in them. Who is St. Peter? In relationship to St. Paul, St. Peter is the apostle to the Jews. Right? He's the apostle to those that are inside. He's the one to whom Christ said, you are the foundation. Right? You are the foundation on which I'm going to build my church. Who is St. Paul? He is the apostle to the Gentiles. He's the apostle to the outsiders. And, and you can even see it more in St. Paul. Because St. Paul, I think he kind of knew what role he was playing. And so he, he, he jokes around with that. He plays around with that. He says that he's the aborted apostle. He says that he is the least of the apostles. He says that he is a shapeshifter. That he is all things to all people. He says, he, how does he convert? He falls off his horse backwards. And so it's like, if you want a better image of the left hand, you would struggle to, to, to find it. Uh, and interestingly enough, you can see, even in St. Paul and St. Peter, you can actually now see the flip side or the negative side of those two aspects, one which is the concentration and one which is the dissipation. So what is the sin of St. Peter? It's pride, right? It's boldness. It's St. Peter who says to Christ, he goes so far as to say to Christ, you don't, you shouldn't, you don't have to die. That's a sin, right? You don't have to break apart. We can do it. We can hold it together. So it's interesting because this quality, which is to be the foundation, which is to the, the, be the one who stands up at Pentecost and boldly proclaims and, 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 and marks this first moment when the church appears as a body, right, is the same thing which leads him to the pride. So the quality and the, the, the say his... His quality and, and his sin are related to the same characteristic. And in St. Paul, what is his problem or his sin? He says it's a thorn in the flesh. It doesn't tell us what it is. It's very interesting, though, to think about what that means. It's that if you understand that the notion of a thorn in the flesh is related directly to the fall. It's a reference to Adam and Eve falling and then encountering the thorns these multiple prickly things that are many, 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 many points. The difference between one point and many, many, many points that are on the edge, okay? So you have this concentration and this dissipation. We understand it as mercy pulling in and as judgment pushing away, all right? So what you're seeing, like I said, is an image of how we interact with things, how we interact with the world. And the, the center gathers them together, right? The proper attention will always be moving subtly between the unity and the multiplicity of whatever it's engaging with. You will always be playing subtly between the fact that something has one identity and it also has multiple aspects. And there's a dance, like a, like a dance between that gathering into one and that spreading out into the many. Now, if you only have the many, you have decomposition, right? It's like if I can, if I only have, this is, this is also the, it's the joke of, of Justin Trudeau, right? It's like, if we just have diversity, that's called decomposition. That's what just diversity is, right? If we only have unity, 
then we have this problem of pride. And the pride is brittle. And it's interesting also in, in St. Peter because his pride, the crystallization, leads to him breaking apart. You see the movement between the two. It's super interesting. Like St. Peter, it's always the same story with St. Peter, right? He holds on, he holds on too tight, and then crashes because he's holding on too tight. He says to Christ, you know, he, he says to Christ, like, he will walk on the water. He's, he can do it. He's going to go out. And then he falls. He says to Christ, who's the one who told Christ he would never betray him? And then who's the one who, betray, who, 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 who's the one who, who denies him, right? And then it's the same with St. Peter. The, the, the craziest one is when, is when he says to St. Peter, when he says to Christ, this is one of the wildest texts in scripture. He says to Christ, you know, that you, she, that you shouldn't die, that, you know, we can, we can stop you from dying. Uh, no, sorry, sorry, no. It's when he, Christ says to St. Peter, you are, the, you are this, the rock, you are the foundation on which I'm going to build my church. He says that to St. Peter, and then St. Peter says that Christ should not die, and then two verses later, Christ says, get behind me, Satan. And it's like right, if you look at it in the text, it's like right next to each other. He says to, Paul, he says to, to Peter, I'm going to found my church on you. And then it's like, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> right? And so, I mean, it's interesting to notice. And it, it, this is, it has to do with your experience, right? I mean, I hope everybody has experienced that. Everybody has experienced the, like, super strict diet. And then you're like, I'm going to do this. I got this. I'm gonna, I got, I've got this. I got this. And then you find yourself at 2 in the morning, you know, eating a piece of chocolate cake. And you're like, what? Right? And you know that that tendency in you, right, the, the, the problem of holding on too tight will lead to the breakdown. Um, and then what's interesting about St. Paul is that, I, I, I noticed it too, is that his ex extreme, his side, will also lead to a kind of weird opposite, which is that I, I love St. Paul, you know, but he, both, he, 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 he brags a lot. It's very, he really brags. It's really interesting. And he, he also brags about his humility. It's kind of weird. It's like the first, like first humble brag uh, character. But I think it's related to this. There's something about this movement from one, like one to the other, you could say. Uh, but it also has to do with, it has to do with the way the, red, the left and the right uh, works. Hopefully we can get to that, I hope. So I want to show you another aspect of this. So this image of St. Peter and St. Paul gets developed in time, and it has different interesting aspects to it. One of the aspects that it develops is something called the, 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 the traditio clavis, and there's the, tradi the, tradi the tradition of the law and the tradition of the keys. And so what you find developing in the Western tradition, this is one of the a very, old, uh, a very old sarcophagus. So one of the things that happens at the outset in the first century is that You'll see the opposite of the left and the right, but they, they flip. And the reason why I think is very simple, for the same reason that when I said on the right side of Christ to you guys, you're like, mm, no, that doesn't make sense. It's because the, the nature of the right and the left is to invert depending on your point of view. And so if I'm standing across from you, my right hand is on your, it, my, let's say if I shake your hand, there's a crossing that happens. So, so, so the left and the right are dependent on position. I actually think that that's actually important in the interpretation of the art and the interpretation of what those, this, those two perceptions we have, how they manifest themselves to us, but I'm not sure I'll be able, you can watch a video, I put it up last week, it's called The Left and the Right Hand of Christ, where I talk about these currents and how they cross each other. So I'm not sure I'm going to go into it too much, but I, what I want to show you is this particular aspect. So, so here again is Christ in the center, he is the middle, on one side of him, he is giving a scroll, and on the, the other side, he's not doing anything yet. We'll see. Do you know what he's standing on? Can anybody guess what he's standing on? Nope. All right, let's go back two slides. All right. What is he sitting on here? All right. Do you, does anybody remember in scripture what it says? What is your throne? No? Well, maybe, but right. heaven is your throne and the earth is your footstool. All right, okay. So go down. So he's standing on the cosmos, actually. All right, and so the cosmos is under his feet. What is he represented by? Is that like an atlas or something? 
It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an allegorical figure. I mean, the Romans had a lot of these. You'll see the cosmos. I don't know if I have other images, but the cosmos actually is a figure that that maintains itself in Christian art, and we still have it, cosmos in in uh, in the Pentecost image, for example. We have this image of cosmos, which represent. You'll see Christ sitting on a globe. You've seen that maybe before. That same deal, right? So different aspects of that. He's sitting on the totality. I told you that this image is about the totality of all things. It's not just an image of a story. It's not an image of a, of a moment in history where Jesus was, had Peter and Paul next to him and was giving them these things. But it is an image of the finality and totality of all things. And so it becomes an image of reality itself. And so here, this, I want to show you just to show you that these are really old. Like they're not, these, are, these are not things that I'm making up. Um, you have here, uh, now you have Christ giving the law on one side, and you don't see it, but he's giving keys on the other side. Keep going down, we'll, we'll get to it, and you'll see it. Now we see him giving the keys, and then keep going. All right, now we see both at the same time. So in one hand, he's holding the key. In the other hand, he's giving a scroll. All right, keep, this is still like fourth fifth century. Uh, go down, yeah, all right, this one we see it. Now, completely develop in terms of an image. So what is going on? What is this? What is this? What is this? What is, what is he doing? Why is he giving the keys to St. Peter? Why is he giving the law to St. Paul? And the answer is in the image of Christ himself. And so the image of Christ has two sides. I told you, he's got one side where he is addressing and he has another side in which he's holding a book. Now these are two aspects of the way that reality presents itself to you again. So addressing is direct, right? If I talk to you, if I bless you, a blessing is a direct relationship. It's like standing in front of you and I say something to you and I bless you. A book is an indirect relationship to anything you encounter. It's indirect, and it's further away from the speech. But it has four aspects. I could tell you about the four. And this is also has to do with the right and the left crossing each other. So speaking is direct, but flexible. Right? Writing is indirect, but fixed. So you have these four aspects playing with each other. You have, to, you have to, it's hard to keep it in your mind, but hopefully at some point if you keep it in your mind enough, you'll be able to see and you'll be able to look at the world and you'll start to think of, let's say, right wing and left wing politics and you're gonna start to realize that that stuff is still there now. Okay. So there's an appeal to authority and this kind of, but a weird kind of flexibility in terms of, it's like, why, are right, why do we say sometimes right when people are libertarians? Like, how does that work? And why is it that, that the same people that want freedom and, and, and equality will want really harsh state systems? It's like this, these four things cross each other. It's direct and flexible, but in, indirect or further away or less relation to the center, if you like it that way, but then also fixed, okay? different ways to, to try to get you to see uh, what is going on. And so what are, key, what are keys for? Right, they're locking, unlocking, opening, closing. These are, let's say, the influence that Christ gives to the church through St. Peter. So you have the power, a direct power, to open and close. And then we have the scriptures which are this indirect barrier that holds things inside. So it, 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 it acts as a buffer, as a, as a barrier to avoid error or things from coming in, but you need both together. And that's why the, the, the traditional church will always have these two aspects together. Like we need the living tradition of direct relationship, you know, from generation to generation. And then we need the exterior forms of a hierarchy, a church hierarchy. We need scripture, we need written liturgies, we need all this outer stuff, which is harsh and a barrier, 
uh, and the other one is direct. And this is, this is their, so these opposites, they're there, you can go down a little more. Like people have seen this image before, and so they're there in the image itself, like right in Christ's face, especially in this very famous image where we see Christ in, with, his, with his right eye looking straight, and there is a calmness, let's say, to the right eye, and then with his left eye looking aloof, looking off, and with also a kind of severity to, to it. So the eye of mercy or the eye of judgment, you can see it that way if you, if you like. But it's important to understand that these two currents that are playing around the center, right, they're not just good and bad. That's, if you could at least leave this discussion with understanding it's not just good, bad. It's more about, it really is about concentric and eccentric. This relationship, the manner in which we encounter the logos. Now remember that Jesus is the divine logos, but the manner in which we encounter the logos of things or of groups or of whatever will fractally have this same structure. Like I said, you have a basketball team, it has a purpose, it has something which is gathering a body together towards something, and there are elements in it which will be merciful and towards the players, because if you just impose, nobody's a perfect basketball player. So you need a right side of mercy, you need a left side because you don't want people playing golf in your basketball game. So you have to also push things away, there's no doubt about that. Um, and then you'll have, you'll have these different aspects which will come together to, let's say, to, uh, to manifest the thing. And this is, this structure is, I mean, it's, it's a universal structure. You see it, one of my favorite uh, quotes is from the poet Rumi, where he says, he says, he says the, if the hand is closed all the time, then, then you are paralyzed. If the hand is open all the time, you are paralyzed. But the, 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 the dance, right, is the very subtle opening and closing of the hand. That is the dance that has to happen. You know, John talks about optimal grip, where anytime I grab something, there has to be a subtle interplay between the manner in which I'm holding it and the manner in which I'm letting it go or, or, or engaging with it in a comfortable manner so I have the right grip on what it is. And that's true for objects, but it's also true for anything. Like it's, it's true for any, like you know people that they are perfectionists to an extent that they will destroy the thing that they want because of their perfectionism. Right? They, they can destroy it, and you know the opposite is as well. If someone is too flexible and just lets anything happen, then they will also destroy the thing that they want. The, the, the dance or the, is to find that play in between, and that image in the Bible or in traditional, any traditional society will appear as something like the heart. Talk about the heart, the central place. The heart is not the bumping, the, the, the pumping uh, valve in your body, although it's part of it, part of the experience of the heart, because that it has that, it has those two movements in it. It has a releasing and a gathering, but it is mostly the notion of the center itself, the notion of the center of your being. All right. So, okay, so go down. All right, so now, you see, I just want to show you a few, a few versions. This is an image in Sicily. Same again, you keep going down. Now here is an image in the church in Egypt. And here we see it all kind of come together where you have Christ on the throne. He has the angels and he has the four beasts. Can you see the four beasts around him? You have the, the, the eagle, the bull, the lion, and the man. And then up, it's, it's a circular surface. So it's hard to see because it's actually a, 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 demi, a half circle. So above you have, can you recognize them up there? Yeah, St. John, the, Saint John the, the Baptist. And on the other side, you have the mother of God. All right, you can keep going. I've got a bunch of versions of this. I don't want to show you too many. So you can see different versions of it. You can represent it in different ways. You can represent it like this. 
right? So you can represent it, the center, the right hand, the left hand, or you can represent it like this, with the top and the middle, and then the right hand and the left hand going down or being lower as you, as you see the body that is gathered into the head or into the top. So this is, uh, this is I don't want to go too much into it, but this is one of the images that bothered me from, when I, from the first time I started looking at this, and I was really struggling with this image, because uh, you have this crossing over of the, of the qualities of the left hand and the right hand that, I, that I'm trying to suggest to you a little. I think I'm, gonna, I'm afraid I'm going to confuse you, but you can see that there's this crossing over, you could say, the idea of something saying that something is direct but flexible, and that something is indirect but static or hard. And so in the image, you have this weird thing, which is that on the right hand of Christ, you have the sheep. On the left hand of Christ, you have the goats. On the right hand of Christ, you have this red angel, which will come to represent St. Michael, and will actually come to be represented with things like a flaming sword, and this warrior that, that's killing the dragon. And then on the other side, you have the blue angel, which will come to be represented as St. Gabriel, ultimately in time, and will be represented with the lily as someone who is presenting peace. So it's like this interesting crossing over of, of sides. This is universal, right? So you have it in this, in the, in, I just chose one image of the pharaoh. The pharaoh has a straight rod and he has a crooked rod. And he crosses them over like this. It's the same problem as the one we saw above. With, so he has the straight and the crooked. This will be, this will be universal. You'll see it with the, with the king holding a scepter and a globe. There are all these different aspects of this straight and round, these two opposites that face each other and that represent the two tendencies, you could say, of, a, of the logos or of the, of the purpose of a being. All right, keep going. This, in the Christian church, it, it comes to the iconostasis. And you can see this is a recent iconostasis. It was made, I don't know, 10 years ago. I don't know. But it's a, it's a contemporary one. And you can see the same structure as we saw in The Last Judgment again. The same, even the flip, where you have Christ on his right, you have the mother of God. On his left, you have St. John the Foreigner. And then on the edges, you have St. Michael, the red angel, and Gabriel, the blue angel. So the, er the other image I showed you is from the fourth century. This is from now. Like, this is a recent image. And so the language has been very universal. I right, keep going. Maybe skip one more. All right. Now, this same structure appears now, the deesis, or the same structure of the center as the logos and the two currents, the two sides, appear in the crucifixion as well. Now, here they appear clearly. So you have two thieves. One of the thief looks to Christ and is gathered into Christ. And the other thief looks away from Christ, mocks, and then is cast away. And so this is something which is there in the very image of the crucifixion. And it, it actually is carried all the way into today. And it's represented in, for example, if you've ever seen a Russian cross that has a foot bar that's crooked like this, right? That's what it's, that's what it's saying. It's talking about this. It says, on the right hand, it goes up. The left hand goes down. Right? The left hand comes, the right hand comes closer, the left hand moves away. You want to keep going? In this image, this is one of the, I'm showing you very old images just so you know that hopefully you realize I'm not making it up. So this is one of the oldest images of the crucifixion we have from the sixth century. And so you see clearly on one side, you see, so now it's flipped again, sorry for the flip, but it's complicated because of that, but you'll see on one side of Christ, you have the thief looking towards Christ. And then on the other side, you have the thief looking away from Christ. And then you have the direct and indirect. Do you know where that is in the image? Where do you have direct and indirect in the image? I'll give you a hint, it's above. Uh, oh. I was say the that is, yeah, that is, that, there's the receiving and let's say piercing, but Especially, you have the sun on the side of the thief that's looking towards Christ. Then you have the moon on the side of the thief looking away. So you have the, 
direct light and indirect light. You also have, with the sun and the moon, you have a lot of things. You have the, the stable and the, say the, the, the straight, and then you have the changing and the shifting, because that's the nature of the moon, of the, uh, the light of the moon. It's, it's moving. It doesn't, it's not stable. It moves from light to darkness. It's, it's, uh, it's change. All right, do you want to go down? So I just want to show you a few versions of, of mine because I thought you would like to see it. So here's a crucifixion I did in wood. You want to go down one more? So here's a, a processional cross for a church. And again, you'll see, again, the other relationship. Actually, go back to the Rabula gospel. The, sorry, go back a few, few. Here, actually, you don't. it's not here. Go down, sorry. In mind, all right. And so now you have again the two figures, and the two figures have switched, but they also represent these two sides. You have the Mother of God on the right hand of Christ, and then you have Saint John the Theologian on the left hand of Christ. So, like I said, you can represent it like this, like the like the deesis that I showed you, or you could represent it like a pyramid. And you can have the center, the purpose, the logos above, and then you can have the two pillars on the lower below. So here's an image of, we call it a proto-ascension, but actually I think it's just a cosmic image of, of the relationship of, of a structure where you have Christ above in the heavens, you have the four corners, the four beasts in the corners, and then you have, actually, you have the dome of heaven. So you know, he's standing on the heavens. You could say it that way. And then below, here in the center, is the church. And then next to the church is St. Peter and St. Paul acting as the two pillars, these two pillars of the church. And this is the, the, two, the, the notion of these two sides, or these two pillars. It's something which is, like, it's there way before. Like, it's not something that comes up in the New Testament or in the church. It's there in the Old Testament. Who remembers what are the two pillars of the temple? Yakin Boaz. Yeah, Yakin and Boaz. So the pillar has two temple, two, the, the, the temple has two pillars. It has Yakin, which is, means foundation. And then it has Boaz, which seems to refer to something like strength. But what's most important about Boaz is that Boaz in scripture, the, the person for whom the, it's named is the one who married the stranger. He's the, the one who married Ruth, who is a Moabite. So you have the apostle to the inside and you have the apostle to the outside. You have St. Peter, you have St. Paul. Right there, right at the outset in the architecture of the temple, okay? So it's just important that, because sometimes I know people are like, Jonathan's just making all this stuff up. <laughs> yeah. All right. And so this image, which is like we call it something like a proto ascension, will be developed. Next slide. And then it becomes an actual image of the ascension. And here you're starting to see this kind of whole structure come together. And so now you have Christ above with the four, the four, uh, with the angels are actually down in the. They're in the chariot. It's hard to see down here. So he is riding the Ezekiel's chariot. He is on this stable representation of, 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 the, of God. He is up above. And he is carrying up those crowns. See those two angels that are carrying up crowns? Those two crowns that you saw in the fourth century being put on St. Peter and St. Paul? Well, here they're represented as being given up towards, towards heaven. So you remember the way I talked about sacrifice and giving up of the best up towards the purpose. And now below you have now the body. Now the mother of God in this image, Mary represents the lower sphere. She represents the, the body itself. And then next to her, again, you will have St. Peter, This is where my theory really comes together because 
a lot of people are like, yeah, no, these are just these are just images of this. They just wanted to find a way to show the ascension, to get over yourself. It's not that complicated. But there's a little problem, is that St. Paul was not at the ascension. He just wasn't there. So why is he there? And he's there, universally there. He's represented not only universally at the ascension, but university, universally at Pentecost as well. That these are not snapshots of events. These are eschatological images. They're images that show us a structure of reality embodied in persons in the same way that I told you about Dante and how heaven is made of people. This is what is going on in, this, in, this, in these images. Now, we don't deny the, the, the actual reality of these people. They have all their individuality, all their idiosyncrasy. But in the manner in which they engage in this pattern, they become like concentrations of qualities and then we see them represented that way in the imagery okay so we have Christ above in the heavens you have the mother below as the body and now we have the two tendencies on each side which are pointing up and gathered together they're gathering together and they're pointing up you want to go down one more? Okay. I like this one because this one, in terms of the, 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 the biblical imagery, is very clear. Now you have Christ sitting on the heavens, which is represented as a rainbow. And now you have the mother of God standing on the footstool. Okay. See? You have St. Peter on the right of Christ. They're harder to see. So we have a representation of the relationship between heaven and earth. The relationship between what St. Paul talks about when he talks about the head and the body. When St. Paul says that we are fitted together, joined together, fitted in love towards the head, it's not, it's not an arbitrary thing. This happens in a way, you could say. These images are there to show you how that happens, right? The manner in which we are both Let's say, moving towards the heart, moving away from the heart in different ways, moving towards the logos, moving away from the logos in, in different ways. Now, once you have this image, now you can do something really cool with this image. With this image, you can do that. You want to go to the next one? You can do this, right? You can explode it into 3D space. And now you have a dome on a square. You have the heavens and the footstool. You have Christ above in the dome. And then you will have, and that in this version, the dome is actually an image of the ascension. It doesn't always have to be that. But originally, this was actually an image of the ascension. Want to go down? Uh, no, maybe not go down right now. Yeah, yeah, sorry, go down. So you can do it that way. You can have a dome, and then in the apse of the church, which, sorry, I don't, I, sadly, I don't have an image, but in the apse of the church, which is, you guys don't know, probably most of you don't know how this, how this happened. So you have a dome at the top, and at the top of the dome, you will have the heavenly man. We'll talk about that later. You have the incarnate man, who represents that point through which heaven comes. Right, so he's above all the angels, all this stuff. He's above all things. And then, let's say, the invisible pattern comes through him and then radiates into the square below. And in the square, you'll have what's called an apse. At the end of the church in the east, you'll have an image of Mary with the child, sometimes even without the child. So you go down. So now you, you could do it that way, or you could also do it, for example, this way. If you don't have a dome, some churches don't have domes. They just have an apse at the end. You could do it this way, which is the same. So you have Christ. Oh, sorry, go up. You have Christ above. So this is now the apse of the church. You guys know what an apse is? The end of a church, sometimes in old churches. See, like, so there's a demi-circle. It's like a mini heaven, you could say, like a little mini, mini half circle at the edge. So you'll, so you'll have Christ above. Sitting on a throne, the four beasts, 
And then below, you have the body, the mother, and then gathered into her, you have St. Peter, St. Paul, and then all the apostles gathered into the body. So it is, a, it is this cosmic structure. You want to go down? I just wanted to show you. So these are some of my versions of the four, uh, the four evangelists. There's here, one here, if you look, if you go down at the entrance of the church, there's a, an image of the lion, St. Mark. All right, you can go down. So I just wanted to show you different ways to do it. And so this, this is a, an image of a church in Cora, where you have Christ in the dome above. And then in the apse, which I've shown here, you can't take a picture of it all together. In the apse, you'll have the mother of God sitting on the throne as well with Christ in her center. Uh, so it's, it's also, can I say this? I'm running out of time, so I won't, I won't go into it too much. So keep going. OK, one more image. <laughs> so I just want to show you, because I'm supposed to end at 3. I just want to show you this last image, which is, it can help you understand how it works in terms of fractal structure. So the mystery about this image, about the structure, is that it's the structure of a church, but it's also the structure of that one icon I showed you of Jesus with the, with the hand and the book. Everything about the whole iconography of the church, all the saints and everything and all this stuff, it's all contained implicitly in the one image. Okay, so you can just have an image of Christ and hidden inside of it is all of this. But then you can blow it up and you can see how it all fractally comes together. There are different ways to represent it. Here at this church in Torcello, they have a very powerful way of representing it. So above you have the cross of Christ. Christ is dying on the cross. On his right hand, he has his mother. The left hand, you have St. John, the foreigner, uh, St. John, the, 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 the evangelist. And the thing is, what's going on in this image? What's going on in that image up there is everything that is below it is contained in the top image. It's contained in it. And so in the, in the image of the crucifixion, we traditionally show a skull at the bottom of the cross. I, I don't know if you can see it, probably can see it. Can you see a little white thing at the bottom of the cross, right? So that's the skull of Adam. It is a, it's an image of death being redeemed. But then that happens below here. So down right underneath you have what's called the harrowing of Hades, which is an explicit image of Christ now going down into death, grabbing Adam and Eve, grabbing the dead, and bringing them all together into the one, into the eschaton, into this totality of all things. And what, what, is the, what is that? Then it's what's below. It is the last judgment. So the image below is the image of the last judgment, where you see the sheep on the right, the goats on the left, people rising up towards Christ on the right, people moving away from Christ on his left. Down there is hell, which is fire and brokenness and inversion and breakdown. On the other side is paradise, which is gathering together. It's imaged in several ways, as Mary herself, as the one that gathered into her heart. It's shown as Abraham, with all the, the, all the children in his bosom, gathering the children into Abraham's bosom. So these different images of gathering, these images of breaking, of burning, of destroying. On the right side, things, they're going up. On the left side, going down. But the idea is that that was already there in the cross in the story of the good and the bad thief. It was already all contained in that little story. Because what does Christ say to the good thief tomorrow? Today you will be with me in paradise. And he's right there, by the way. This is the good thief, sorry. You can't see him, it's too small. The good thief is actually represented in paradise, the only person actually represented in paradise. Because all of this is what's going on up there. So my point, hopefully, at least, is that you, 
understand how this language right, is a language, an imaginal language of participation in the very structure of our experience. At least, you, hopefully you can see that. And it's there in the very structure of the image, in the very understanding of the characters, and in the way in which all these images fit into each other. They kind of collapse into each other so that you could have just this image of Jesus and it's all implicitly there, okay? So hopefully, I didn't lose too many people, I'm sure I did. Thank you for your time.